From the 1940s to the 1980s, the hierarchical government was the most dominant mode of governance among states. This governance approach was characterized by bureaucratic institutions, equity-oriented policies, public sector actors and organizations. The states were entirely in charge of providing water supply in urban areas and developing water resources for large-scale agriculture. In some countries, these hydraulic bureaucracies became more powerful than other administrative policy-making groups within the governments. In the 1980s, the hierarchical mode of governance was questioned as many states were affected by a strong fiscal crisis that provoked the need for austerity and reducing public bureaucracy. Moreover, difficulties of providing adequate water services led to a water crisis. These two issues gave the neoliberal ideas the chance to be prominent in the mode of governance. But what would have been the main reasons for the neoliberal discourse to convince states about private sector participation in water management? Well, Klaus Schwartz, researcher at the Water Governance Chair Group at UNESCO IHE in Delft, may know some of them. One of the reasons is to get access to management expertise, which uh, is perhaps present in the private sector but not in the public sector. Uh, another reason may be that the government wants to get access to private funding, private finance, and then uses uh, privatization to, uh, to get access to private funding. As Dr. Schwartz just mentioned, through these two reasons, those that were pro-privatization for the water sector claimed that privatization was the way forward to provide safe and sufficient water supply to the poorer population. Furthermore, with the failure by state or public-run utilities to supply water to the poorer population, private companies would better run state-owned utilities at reduced costs, thus leading to affordable water supply to the underserved population at reduced costs. Now, what exactly is neoliberalism? For some academics, neoliberalism is a doctrine that promotes privatization while prescribing reforms and processes such as deregulation, re-regulation and marketization. This rolls back the government participation and increases the role of private sector and communities in the decision-making process. Privatization started in the 1990s with the Washington Consensus and the policy reforms of countries such as the UK. These type of reforms were extended to the Global South via international financial institutions. Firstly, by reforming institutions. Secondly, by reforming organizations. Thirdly, by reforming governance. And finally, including new actors. So, did these reforms achieve improved water services? Um, I think also here you have to uh, think about how, so, so what, what, what determines the success of, of, of private sector involvement and the process of privatization, the process of involving the private sector is very important in this, uh, in this question. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult to give a straight answer, uh, has privatization improved water supply and sanitation? Uh, it depends very much. Uh, on a particular location, how the process of privatization took place. Uh, also very important is what were the problems, what were the initial problems that uh, the government was trying to address uh, through involving the private sector. After analyzing the trends of neoliberalist ideas, let's take a look at the Philippines case. Dr. Phil Torrio is a researcher in water privatization and equity issues from the University of British Columbia. He will explain the privatization process in Metro Manila, Philippines, and help us understand the neoliberalist movement in the water sector. So, water was intermittent. It was not available 24 hours a day. Pressure was low. Pressure couldn't go up to the second floor of a building. Quality was okay, but again, service coverage was only at 67% and you were losing water at 58%, which means that if you sent 
of water to the system, you lost 58%. That's typical of uh, reasons for privatization because the government, uh, those that are for privatization, always say that the government is very inefficient with respect to operating water systems and that the private sector can do a better job and at the same time bring in the private financing. Whether that's true or not, uh, that's still a big issue until today. How did the Philippine government implement privatization? Privatization in the Philippines started first with power, with the power sector. And if you read the literature, privatization always comes when there's, um, when there's a crisis. So there was a power crisis, and this was followed by a water crisis because of the bad performance of government. And to be able to do any privatization program, there has to be, there has to be a law or a, a governing law that allows you to do privatization. Most of the time, countries would have to develop this law first and put it into place before they are able to do privatization, which is the same case here in the Philippines. The Philippines is able to do privatization and public-private partnerships because of a certain law that was put up sometime in the 1990s. And this is called the uh, Build, Operate, Transfer Law. What were the determining factors for privatization? Neoliberalization ideology was really being pushed. Um, and you see the push coming from the US and the UK. Multinational institutions like the World Bank and the International Finance Corporation, they were pushing for privatization at that time. So there, you, see, you have the government that wanted to do privatization. You have this multinational institutions that was pushing also for privatization. And there was a problem seemingly in, that needed to be fixed. You almost had all the ingredients for a privatization program to take place. You also had a lot of uh, the foreign water companies pushing for privatization because uh, they were looking at in investing in, in those countries. So you see uh, almost all the ingredients for a privatization program to take place uh, uh, at that time. How to improve the process of privatization? At this time, I would put emphasis as well on equity, meaning being able to provide water for the poor sector. Another main focus that probably, um, it was probably there, but it was not uh, emphasized. Um, the thinking was that if you did, if you operated efficiently, the equity portion would follow, but that uh, does not usually happen um, from the literature and as well as from my own research. Yeah, that normally does not happen. There has to be targets specifically for poor households that, that should be spelled out in the agreements or what is called the concession agreements with the, with the private sector. Let's hear what other Philippines think. What I have seen over there, the utility was privatized. The services has improved because the people manning utility are competent enough to do their jobs. Unlike if it was managed the government, which uh, the, managed, uh, the manpower will depend on how uh, the politicians will get people to manage there. So if you have uh, privatized, because they are profit oriented, they will do their best to, do the, uh, the, to give service to the people. 
they used um, the water crisis in Asia as a staging point to launch privatization experiments in the, across the region. But for the last 10 to 15 years, we've been the laboratory of privatization projects and guinea pigs. It has failed to deliver its promises of you know, efficient delivery, um, transparent and uh, democratic uh, water systems of lower prices. Those promises have failed miserably. After all this journey from the global north to the global south, do we believe that efficiency can go hand in hand with equity in water services, but endeavors are needed to increase equity without slowing down efficiency? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mambo number five. Okay. What we all can be completely sure of is that it will take time to achieve the goal of full water equity for all. Is neoliberalism the answer to accomplishing this? Okay. Okay.